Good morning and welcome to Monday Matters. My name is Jane Roughly. In 2013, Mossman Library Service launched Doing Our Bit, which is an online resource dedicated to the local men and women who enlisted in World War I. The site provides a forum for descendants to share information, images and stories. From the start, Dara has made significant contributions to Doing Our Bit through his investigative research skills and descriptive writing. He has also put together exhibitions to illustrate this research. Dara's work has included little known stories about local heroes, including the impact of influenza on returning Anzacs and romance at Georges Heights Hospital. His favorite topic, the aviators of World War I, is the subject of his presentation this morning. Dara presented part one of Pioneers of Australian Aviation in April. He had a lot more information and stories to tell, hence part two of his presentation today. I'm very pleased to introduce Dara Christie. Thanks very much, Jane, um, for those wonderful words. Yes, um, as you, you may know me or, or, or not, um, my name's Dara, and I'm going to be presenting this um, talk today on the Legends of Australian Aviation. Um, last time we had a few technical issues and this is um, all new doing, um, doing this format, but we'll, what we'll do is, um, it's basically a slideshow with me talking. And so you might wanna switch to your, your slideshow mode for that because it's, it's basically that's where most of the presentation is. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do is run quickly through what we, we um, went through last time because I said like we had those those technical issues and then we'll jump straight into the, the war service of um, the three um, pioneers, PG Taylor, um, um, Smithy and Charles Orn. At the end, we'll probably have questions. Um, feel free to jump in, but I've probably got a, quite a bit of work to get through. So uh, I, might, I might just start now. All right, so. So it all starts off at the very beginning, of course. Um, on the left is a photograph I took in the Louvre of the sort of half man, half winged Syrian creatures. On the right is kind of the theme of this story, uh, which is the um, Icarus flying <coughs> close to the sun. So it's all about Im human imagination and, um, you know, sort of the reality behind um, pioneering man trying to fly. So basically, we break off flight into two areas, um, lighter or heavier than air, so balloons and aeroplanes. Um, a balloon attic is defined as a person who is balloon mad. So we'll do a quick history of that. So on the left, you see a picture of, it looks like Versailles. Um, so ballooning really took off in say Europe or France in the 17th century. And um, so here you have, uh, balloon at Versailles. Um, the other end of the social scale, you have people attacking a balloon because of the newness of this technology. Here's a picture of various whirly gigs um, that um, were experimental. Some flew, some were just um, thoughts of the mind. First time balloons were used in warfare was um, when the Austrians attacked Vienna and they flew um, very basic balloons, which were um, totally unsuccessful despite the very dramatic picture here. And um, in, in fact, most of them floated over Venice and I read somewhere that they actually, some of them dropped on their own army. So not very successful. Um, by World War I, uh, balloons um, and zeppelins had morphed into zeppelins and become objects of terror in the imagination. So it became a nightmare rather than a dream. It's almost like they came from outer space sort of thing. And by the time we get to World War I, we see the evolution of its use in warfare, which is basically um, spotting the other side. Um, so you can get at them. This is a Napoleonic battle with a balloon out in front and probably directing cannon fire and doing the same thing here in World War II with the Australian um, troops looking on in the background. Just a quick aside, HMS Sydney, who's a master's now at um, Bradley's Head, 
it was involved in both these um, types of um, aerial combat. First was the first engagement between a Zeppelin and, and HMS Sydney, a ship. Um, it was an inconclusive um, affair. And later on, Sydney flew um, aeroplanes and that it was one of the first um, ship to, or aeroplane to, to um, aeroplane battles after the Sydney was attacked from the air by one of these sort of German flying boats. You can see that it's still very basic. The only way to land was in the water and that could have mixed results. So um, the rise of aeroplanes all the way back to Leonardo da Vinci and this chap here, I think he's a German um, using a sort of a glided flight trying to imitate birds and bats. When I was in Paris again, I found this interesting machine, Avion number three. Um, as you can see, it's powered by steam engine. Um, the owner said it got off the ground, but in fact, it probably hadn't. It, it may have been a gust of wind that, that blew it over. But as you can see, imitating the, the, the wings of a bat and you've almost got moth-like um, propellers out the front. And yeah, you probably, in, in a way, you're probably glad he didn't get off the ground because it, it mightn't have got far. Um, eventually, aeroplanes did get off the ground. This is a picture of Harry Houdini. Um, there's Harry doing his thing with um, getting thrown off bridges and chains and all the rest of it. And here is him actually taking a solo flight in Melbourne. Right, so now we come to our three aviators. Um, what I'm going to do is switch now um, from Bill Taylor over to Charles Orm and Smithy. So we might just go over to that slide now. Okay, let's grab a cup of tea, folks. Okay, that one. Yeah. Right, here we go. So, Charles Orm. Okay, so Charles Orm is a local. He's um, he was born in 1898, as most around that time, most of these flyers for the First World War were around 1896, 88, um, 84. He's the son of a Parisian born artist, um, and Emma Orm. So, his family moved from Victoria to 27 Kestron Avenue, Mossman. And he worked as a stockbroking clerk at a company at the outbreak of, break of the war. Um, his background, of course, was French, um, his parents. And so he was um, encouraged to join up, but he actually um, joined up a little bit early, as we will soon see. So he's one of the first um, troops at, at ANZAC on April the 25th. And he was wounded shortly after and sent to uh, Razel Tin Hospital, which is um, in Alexandria. So that's a picture of, um, of all their studio portrait. And there's another one, classic one in front of the Sphinx, um, tourist photograph. Um, so he, he was, um, as I mentioned, um, when he enlisted, he was actually underage and um, he, he sort of registered under a non de plume or a, a fake name as Charles Jackson. And here we see the, um, his, um, his um, enlistment papers. So basically you've got Charles Jackson, uh, his correct address and um, his height is, I think it's five foot seven. And he says he's 19 years old, I believe. Now, um, he was, I think, 15 at the time, but he was a very tallish sort of lad and they didn't, they weren't fussy about who, who they were taking in. Um, and they weren't gonna check his um, bona fides. Usually there would need to be permission from the parents, written permission um, to sign up. So anyway, um, this is a, a letter on the right from his mother to the authorities. Um, you notice that it says, you know, 27 Keston Avenue and, so, and sort of reveals that, you know, in fact, his name is Charles Orm and could his, um, his payments or effects be forwarded under that name? Um, and then a, a bit more about his background. That was once he landed back in Sydney. Now, the reason for 
him landing back in Sydney um, was, just trying to go back there, something that was um, a little bit awkward. Um, so basically he was turned on the, the Ballarat and the, the reason is venereal. So when, you know, there's a lot of um, social stigma with this, of course, especially at the time and even now. Um, but anyway, just put it in context, one of 60, he was just one of 60,000 cases and a, which was about 15% of the AIF. Um, the treatments were very painful. You can see some of the, the instruments down here. And um, unfortunately, penicillin and, and in fact, the cure for viruses for the flu um, wasn't discovered till later. Anyway, that's the hospital he was stayed at. That's his, um, that's his um, sort of report there. And he's, he's known now as um, Charles Jackson, Jackson, later to be known as Charles Orme. Um, this was a, a picture of a, a, an Egyptian lady, which was found as a postcard. I, I couldn't find any images anywhere of, um, uh, of this sort of thing, because you know their story doesn't get told. But uh, there's, there was postcards donated to the library. And this was one of the postcards, which I've been able to use as part of my, my research. So yes, that's, things do turn up and, and it's, it's a good resource to have. All right, so moving forward, um, Charles um, signed up again with his parents' approval, signed up as um, Charles Orn, and he was with the 45th Battalion. Um, so, yep, they, they were positive about him doing that. His grandfather fought the Germans in, in um, the 1870 wars, so they were right behind that. Um, here's a picture of um, men from the 45th in the trenches. Um, he, being Charles Um, was wounded, as we can see from this um, document from the archives. He was wounded at a place called Corby Canal um, near Amiens um, in France. And from the report, you can see he's, he's shot or wounded in the knee and, and he had a, other injuries as well. So sent back to England with that. Um, and here we can see the report here of the, the wounds on his body. Um, probably something that he would have um, struggled with most of his life as most of them did. And came back to Mossman and did rehabilitation at the George's Height Hospital. Here we see a picture from the time, George's Height. And then I took a picture uh, then and now sort of one uh, I think last January. So now I've turned into artist huts, that sort of thing. Uh, there's a little room um, and I found, I opened the book at the page and so it's just confirmation that there was a patient here at this hospital. Um, it's a lovely spot if you ever want to go there and walk around, it's um, very pleasant. Uh, it's little cafes and that sort of thing. So, okay, so what? these three well they're all from the same area um, or have connections with the area and they all flew with each other after the war at one stage or the other so after the war Charles, Charles Orme flew with PG Taylor here's a picture of we're not going to go into this today this is for for another time but um, this is a picture of them at Jeringong Beach I think about to fly off to New Zealand and here's a picture of them stuck um caught in the tide in Ireland. So beaches were actually used as runways in different places because they were stable platforms, unless of course the tide came in, and, um, yeah, ended up like that. So um, the other person all flew with, of course, was Smithy. And um, he had famous flights, record breaking flights, including the one in the uh, across the Pacific. Here's a picture of Ormond Smithy's starting up of National Airways. In, um, in Australia. And here's a, a picture of them landing in Sydney um, with all the crowds. They were sort of pop stars of the day. They, I mean, people um, were divided by the, the distance of the oceans and all the rest of it. And, and it's hard to, unless you read about, there's a good um, description by um, Michael Malkinton who did a talk here of the difficulties of, of, of flying in those days over vast um, stretches. and. They were the first ones to do it from America to Australia. Um, when Orm came back, and once again, this is for another time, um, 
all of the localities that suburbs host them. And the big one was at, here at Mossman, there was a big parade down Military Road, um, celebrations. There's also a monetary thing involved with this. So you basically, you know, there, there's the fame and the adulation, but there was also checks coming in in order to support their next venture. Um, and this is a, a, a lovely presentation book given to Charles Orm um, from uh, the municipality and, and soldiers and, and to commemorate that day. So um, the Orm Connection uh, has been recently memorialized um, and the Mossman um, Historical Society can tell you more about that, but there's a plaque now on the, the council chambers, um, which was put up during COVID. And um, I believe or sometime recently, last July, um, and in the words of um, John Orm's, um, sorry, Charles Orm's son, John, he's from his first marriage, um, because of his dad, we now jump on and off planes like buses. And that's kind of true in a way because they did really try and start up the first air, airways in Australia and, and were, were pioneers. But we'll talk about that at another stage. Okay, so take a breath. And next person is Charles Kingsford Smith. Um, this was a picture I found of a basically describes his life in a few frames, um, his flying life. So you've got his first World War experience, his um, um, and his specific flights in, in different types of aircraft after the war. Um, this is from the Aero Historians, and this is his rap sheet of his flying career, very extensive, um, and his awards. On the right, you have pictures of Charles. That's Charles as a baby. Charles is a choir boy, Charles is a new recruit, and Charles wounded. Um, interesting enough, a just quick aside was a lot of the um, information I got about him was from a fellow called Norman Nelson, who was also a lo local um, and who knew um, Kingsford Smith. Um, so his biography and Ian Mackenzie's, I'd, I'd recommend, they're the best ones uh, that I've read on him. Um, I, I could be corrected if someone else has read something else, but it, um, Ellison was um, connected with the area, as I said, and he he was at the landing of Smithy's flights and involved in reporting on that as a journalist. And he also suggested that the mask, the mask um, be put down at Bradley's head. And he suggested that to the um, to the, the mayor at the time. Um, so, and that's been documented. So Charles, even though we saw a picture of him as a um, as an innocent um, choir boy, he had a um, more sort of um, loutish um, sort of side. So this is from Ellison, and Charles' risk-taking behaviour started early in life. Catherine, his mother, called him Chiller, so that was his family nickname, and there's a reason behind that, which I won't um, uh, won't go into now. So he delighted in living dangerously, riding his bicycle at frantic, frantic speed on the suburban footpaths, careering down steep hills, hands off the handlebars. His late teens to satisfy his passion for noise and power, he acquired a second-hand motorbike on which his recklessness soon earned him the nickname, the Terror of Mossman, and numerous police warnings for speeding. Ne Neighbours predicted that he would break his neck, but as the bike he wrecked, smashing it one day through a wall of a dairy and ending up in a heap of bottles and confectionery. So he got up to other nefarious activities, including having mates over for smoking parties when his parents were out and dropping bungers near lovers canoodling, as well as a whole lot of other things that upset the sleepy um, area and the, and the local residents. So he put his motorbike skills to good use. Um, he wanted to enlist before his 18th, but he finally got the chance on his 18th birthday. Um, so he was shipped off to Gallipoli via Egypt. And in a letter home, he wrote about the, the risks of um, running messages. Obviously they didn't have um, motorbikes at Gallipoli, but they had to run between the trenches um, and hand deliver messages. And he said, snipers are pretty bad at the foot of the gully and get our chaps fairly often. One has to do a sprint tap or have a bullet after him. Um, after surviving Gallipoli, Chile saw action in France. He was now a dispatch rider with the 4th Division C Signal Company. 
with the rank of sergeant. Once again, he had a few close calls, um, including surviving near misses with German shells. Um, Charles's letters home were upbeat, but after seeing the front line first hand, he confessed some of the sights out there are really sickening. So you find in his letters home, he, he's quite sort of chipper and he doesn't really want to um, get his parents worried. So it was sort of a flippantness to his sort of his character and sort of a, you know, devil may care. And he's always having these near misses. Smithy was posted to 23 Squadron. Um, this, so he was in the, in the, um, in the infantry and like many um, men, he found that the best way to get out of that um, and still do his bit was to try and join the Royal Flying Corps. Um, there's also an Australian Flying Corps of, uh, of its own right, but um, initially I think they were quite fussy about who they took, but after um, you know attrition rates and all the rest of it, uh, they were, were accepting people from the infantry to come into the, um, the Air Force. Um, that being said, it was mainly um, people from uh, the upper, upper classes or educated or who had connections, probably both. So which Smithy did, he went to, um, uh, you know, good schools and, you know, he, he knew how to get through the interview and he was, um, yeah, he made it through the training courses to the Royal Flying Corps and ended up in a place called La Louvre, La Louvre, La Louvre Aerodrome in the pub, um, in France. So I found this map um, online and it turned out to be quite useful because this is a French coast here. Um, you've got the front line drawn here and then you've got all the squadrons listed, flying squadrons, um, British squadrons listed here. So La Louvre is located about here and um, we're going to come to Gordon Taylor's, um, Bill Taylor's um, career next, and his 66 quadrant was related, was, um, was here further south. Um, so the front line was in 1917, about September, August, was here, and there's a big push going on for Ypres, and the Germans were patrolling their side of the lines, which is these purple, um, rough purple areas. So basically all the, the um, air battles were, were located in this area. There was another pilot which I was looking at, which I haven't done a story yet on, who was actually shot down in this area, Langemark, and then taken as a prisoner, um, or Langemark. Um, yeah, so that's the situation. Looks a bit complicated. So when he was posted the squadron, he flew um, the, what's known as the, um, the SPAD. I, it was a French design plane, but I think built by both British and French. This was again, another postcard, which was found in our collection. It's, um, it's in the, um, uh, yeah, come back to me. It's in Paris, um, Indian Village, um, where they have the tomb of Napoleon. And so it's very much about French pride. And this guy is a French um, fighter ace. This is what um, this is what um, Smithy's plane would have looked like. So exactly the same plane, just with British markings. So he said about the um, the Spads. They said he said they're great machines. They fly at 140 miles an hour, and it's some going up. So 140 miles an hour was pretty fast in those days. Um, now it's sort of a top speed for a car or whatever. Despite only having a single machine gun, it was maneuverable, dived and climbed well, up to 20,000 feet. And they could also take a bit of punishment as he was later to find out. So as you can see, it's quite a compact aeroplane. And this one here is the SPAD-7, which he flew, which had one machine gun. And this is the um, one was two. Okay, doubled up there. So, after getting to the squadron, um, he noticed that there was a lot of empty chairs and the attrition rate was pretty high. Um, it wasn't long before he was, he was in the action and I can read out some of his words on that. So just a short 
No, it's time to let you know I'm all right. I got my first hun this morning. Ados attacked about 20 huns and had the dickens of a fight. One dived across in front of me. So I got my sight on and let him have it at about 50 rounds before he could get out of the way. I had the satisfaction of seeing him chuck up his arms and fall back. The machine glided on for a while and then nose, nose dived straight for the ground. I had bad luck after bag, bagging my first bird that my gun jammed and I had to leave the scrap and tootle off home. Yesterday we had another scrap and I had a rather narrow squid. My gun jammed early in the fight and I put my nose home to get it fixed. When three spare huns sat on my tail and kept there all the way, they were firing all the way down. I landed with holes all over my machine and a burst of a dozen alongside my ear. It was, I was rather badly scared. So this is his experience with a, with a dog fight. He reckons he shot down one and, and noticed that his, his guns are jamming a lot. So that's why they ended up putting two on this aircraft because you know you, you get jam up a gun. The other task he was um, given was to shoot down balloons or balloon busting. So um, balloons, sound, it sounds like an easy job, but actually um, balloons were quite well defended up from the ground and it could be, and so they were considered to be a kill the Samson aeroplane. Um, so once again, in his own words, he was, um, he was ending a patrol and he looked down the ground far below. He saw a field grey line snaking through the obliterated landscape. German troops en route to the front. Resting in one mass of humanity, he broke formation, swooped onto the, into a screaming dive. Over my sights, I could see men moving down the road, but there were too many of them to move quickly. I pressed press the trigger. Tracer bullets zipped along the road and I saw men falling and hundreds of them scrambling to get out of the way. I was filled with an unearthly joy. Smithy shouted over the roar of the engine noise as he lined up another pass. It was like shooting field grout mice in a barrel. He couldn't miss. I kept my finger pressed hard on the trigger and I turned and roared back with my machine gun spitting death. I saw dozens of men bowled over. After his ammunition was spent on the infantry below, Smithy put his spad into a climb. Cracks of rifle shots followed the aircraft. He landed back at the aerodrome, cut the ignition and climbed out of the cockpit. And this is in his words again. After the noise of the engine and the gun, everything all was sudden, everything all of a sudden was quiet. I could hear the birds whistling and the men laughing and talking. Contact with these realities suddenly made men realize the horror of the thing that I'd done. I leaned against the fuselage and vomited. I was 20 years old, I just killed men and I hadn't the faintest idea why. For those few minutes, I had gone completely insane. Now I felt utterly miserable and hated my weakness for doing what I did. So this is a theme um, uh, of a, a very general theme of, you know, joining up for the adventure, um, getting involved, finding out about the, the reality and then some, and, you know, becoming disillusioned and carrying on. So then it was his turn. So heading from a regular patrol on the 14th of August, Smithy noticed something, an aeroplane from his flight broke formation. Thinking the other pilot had spotted an enemy aircraft, he followed. Smithy flew back into black bursts of AA fire and then losing his wing mate turned back. Shortly, the trap was sprung. On the 29th, he recalled what happened next. I spotted two hun two seaters away below me. I proceeded to turn the old bus on her nose and dived. I sort of recollect a fearful clatter in my ear and a horrid bash on my foot, which made me think the whole leg had gone. Then I fainted, I turned out the the bullet had busted numbers of nerves and the shock set me off. When I came to 30 or 40 seconds later, or whichever, whenever it was, I was spinning nose first down to Hunland. These, the little holes and chips of wood, etc., were suddenly appearing all around me where the Hun bullets were chewing things up. I tried to turn around to scrap, but my whole left leg was paralyzed and I could only fly ahead as fast and as steadily as I could to our lines and pray that he wasn't a very good shot. The German fighter stalking in the clouds above had pounced while he was diving on the two-seater. The Justice Scout swooped into Smithy's blind spot, perfect timing. Smithy's spad was sprayed with a burst from two Spandau machine guns at point blank range. Smithy's adversary, um, Ober Lieutenant Willem Reinhardt, followed the stricken spad down to issue the coup de grace, which thank goodness in, in um, 
it's been his third uh, words he couldn't achieve. So basically what happened was that they'd use a decoy, um, like a two-seater plane, and then if the opposite uh, opposition fighter attacked the plane, someone else higher up in the clouds would be, would be waiting for that to happen. And this guy was a bit of a crack shot and, and hit um, Smithy from the side and then chased him chased him down. The deadly chase presumably lasts all the way to British lines, but Smithy just made it back. I was feeling groggy. Blood was gradually filling up my boot past the knee. More by instinct than anything else, I made a moderate good landing and then crashed out of the bus and finally collapsed. They rushed the ambulance up and took me away to, to the CSS where they operated. By his own admission, own admission, it was a marvellous escape, considering there were 180 bullet holes in the machine and dozens round my head within inches. Fortunately, any that hit the engine didn't do any damage and it never conked out. So once again, a very near miss. He was shot in the foot. This is the bloke that shot him down, I think. So he would have been flying one of these albatross planes. This is him later with a with a um, Fokker triplane. He's crashed this one and it's hard to tell whether he's thankful or proud or, you know, just um, a bit embarrassed by the whole thing. And that's him more nonchalantly photographed there, but he was a, he was a um, was an ace of sorts. Um, I'll try and move through this quickly without reading. Um, so basically, um, he went into surgery, and um, he said that he had a kind of a cloven hoof foot because it was um, cut down the middle. Um, his parents would have been relieved that he wasn't nothing worse is happening. This is a picture of him here, sort of standing on one foot. This poor bloke looks like he's standing on one foot or lost a leg. Um, but shortly after he was awarded an MC. Um, so for conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty. So that's the, the medal there. And um, it was mainly for shooting down balloons. He, he was... I think someone claimed that he shot down fire planes, but I think it was only two and two probables or something. Um, there's a lot of difference between claims and, and, and actual tallies. And, and in those days, they didn't really consider them the ACE status. If that was something that came after the war. So he gets his award and um, he's quite sort of flippant about it. In later life, he wrote his biography um, but he does describe how he went to see the king and, um, and um, because of his state with his crutches and his, um, and his um, you know, injury, he took a step back as was the protocol and ended up spilling up all over the floor. So he said he got it for various acts of foolishness. After this, he comes home back and here's a newspaper clipping um, from... Uh, the time um, he came back to um, recuperate. So it says here, Sid Sydney Airman comes home. The Huns are well lit. So it identifies him as Lieutenant Kingston Smith, age 20 of Mossman, and the, how he's been awarded the, um, the military cross. So when he came back, he, his family said he was quite shy, but he was always, um, you know, one for the ladies and one of them said that unless she was going out and looking her best that she wanted him in uniform. So after that, he used to wear his uniform. Um, and fortunately, um, there was an occasion where he was catching the ferry from Mossman and he got sort of ribbed by a few hoons on the, the thing about his uniform. And um, apparently this was reported in the paper how he um, knocked their heads together. So, um, yeah. Anyway, this is a picture of him. It's a very bad photo. Um, it's a picture of him with his family and, and, and relatives uh, on leave back in Australia, in Sydney. His only duty in Sydney was to, um, he was asked to go up to the entrance area near Tuggera Lakes to, there was reports of strange sightings in the, so in the sky. Um, this is a bit of an aside, I looked it up. And apparently they'd seen strange lights and all the rest of it. There was a bit of paranoia about German ships and, um, and the float plane that, that was um, 
the Wolfshin, I think it was called, that was around the coast at the time. It was interesting when I Googled it, um, 1994, there was a whole lot of sightings of strange lights and, and UFO type things. Um, so anyway, there's a whole society apparently up there that's based around this and gets funding. Right, so he finishes the war. This is a picture of him with the uh, tra training instructors. So he's not no longer in the front lines, he's training pilots. Um, typically he's the only one without a cap on and he's looking a bit sort of nonplussed or, you know, um, he was known as King Dick. Um, so this is because, uh, as you're saying, he was, a, he was a fast worker and he'd sort of have girls on the go and, um, and yeah, that was his sort of, his reputation. I think these men, once they'd seen what they'd seen and he already had a, uh, you know, a, a penchant for, for risk taking and being out there, it's, um, it was fairly common. So after the war, what do these pilots do? They've got, um, you know, they've got these skills, but they're, they're basically out of work. So he starts these joy flight companies. Um, and there's a bit of controversy there because they keep crashing the airplanes they're buying from army surplus at very cheap prices and getting insurance on them for more than their value. So this could have just been a bit of bad luck or a bit of opportunism, but eventually um, here's them with one of the airplanes there. There's his two mates um, that they set the company up with. Eventually this did get around the higher circles and he was supposed to fly this plane here, which is the Blackburn Kangaroo to Australia in the 1919 air race. And he was kind of like, um, it's sort of like not knowing the time, but he was, he was basically, you know, he was, because of his reputation, he was told that he couldn't make this flight. And um, I think one of his, his mates here too as well, um, he was really disappointed about that because there was a lot of prize money on offer. It was won by two other Smiths, um, Keith and Ross Smith in the Vimy. But as you see, this aeroplane crashed in Crete, so he wouldn't have probably made it anyway. But um, yeah, some interesting people on board. I'll move on. So after that, he went from England to the US to California to work as a stunt pilot um, to try and earn a buck there. Um, I won't read all the writing, but basically this is a picture of him doing wind walking, okay, and hanging off the, the bottle of, bottom of an aeroplane. He decided it was just too too crazy. People were just, you know, wanting too much for what, what, what he was getting back from that. So he ended up being, he was broke, and he ended up coming back to Australia after leaving California. And then all of this gave him the impetus to, you know, to, to do big and better things um, and, and dream of, you know, crossing the Pacific or, or going from England to Australia. Um, okay, just finishing up with Smithy. So basically, um, there is another connection with the Mossman area. This lady, Nellie Stewart, she was an opera singer and performer. And when he was in camp, his sister invited her to him to come along and, um, and he wanted to get an autographed card off her because he was, she was her, his idol. And she, he got invited into the city at what, from camp and um, he came to meet her and there'd been some sort of hazing exercise going on or something because he'd had his eyebrows shaved off and his hair as well. And so his sister was mortified to introduce him to this um, star of the stage, but he ended up getting a card offer, um, which he kept through all of his flights, um, even after the war, and it was his sort of lucky charm. Um, and she came to his um, ceremony um, in 1934, and she lived in the Mossman area. Um, I think until her death. So, uh, yeah, she's buried down in Melbourne. Um, so he was um, man of many talents. So on the top left-hand corner, you can see him playing the ukulele. He was a very – he had um, – he went to the musical school in the city. He had um, – you know, he, he used to entertain in the officer's mess, usually ball sort of songs and that sort of thing. But he was a very good pianist and, um, and um, well – yeah, ukulele player. Um, on the right, it was an unusual photograph I found. Um, 
he's in dressed up in a bit of um, you know, for a bit of pantomime, uh, and it's interesting that I found so many pictures of um, you know from uh, prisoner war camps to um, navy ships to whatever where it was quite common for uh, men to do this sort of thing and obviously in an all male society you need people to play the girls and they're all sort of happy to do that but I don't know what um, but it's interesting sort of angle um, you don't normally see for the first war this picture I included because um, the clarity of the photograph is amazing so I don't know if this is a sister or a lady friend or you know whoever but just it's just a nice photo really um, so that's why I put that in there. So that's, um, we're done with Smithy. So now we'll go back to um, E.G. Taylor. So we'll just go to English. Okay, so P.G. Taylor's our last one. P.G. Taylor flew with both Smithy and Moore. Okay, so here, of course, is his um, his flight career. This is a picture of him, nineteen seventeen, young man, um, ready to um, with his wings and uniform. Just giving a bit of help here. Okay, great. Um, sorry, I just. So we're just flicking through here to get to the spot. Okay. Great. All right, here we go. So um so there there is his um career. So 1890s Mossman. Um, we've got um, Mossman in 1890s um, advertising um, land in Mossman. We've got the ferry service. There was no, no Harbour Bridge then. Also have trams. There's a picture of a, a tram going up a hill. A lot of them went down to the, um, the ferries on, uh, on steep gradients. And this is um, by, um, I think his name was Hopkins. And he was um, saying how slow the trains were. It's, it's got a tortoise pulling up the hill. This is the um, sort of pleasure gardens in um, in Clifton Gardens, and you've you've got um, this big um, swimming pool and diving area, um, change rooms, hotels. You've got it's very hard to see, but you've got people here in their sort of finery, looking over the bay. You've got a um, a ferry bringing pleasure seekers to the to the area so it was sort of a, a bit of a weekend retreat sort of place very very sleepy um, just starting to become a modern suburb and in 1896 this fellow Pat Taylor became the mayor he was a um, entrepreneur of sorts uh, the first council meeting um, they decided um, Hopkins drew this this um, coat of arms for them, um, the whale to do with the previous whaling. Um, so not, not so cute, but, you know, um, that was a previous industry, but it's a nice mascot. Um, this is Taylor's um, election manifesto, and it's actually, like, it's all about improving the suburb, improving the roads. Um, you know, it's all good civic stuff. This was happened on a um, New Year's Day. It was. It just shows the early development of flight and, and um, in the local area, someone um, trying to to get a very early experimental plane off the ground, not succeeding. Okay, so Taylor came from a house called New Street. In, it was in Raglan Street, so there's quite um, nice houses like this one in Raglan Street. I don't think it was quite that flash but it still would have been substantial. Um, they own properties in Pitwater and Mossman and other places. Um, this is pictures from the time of, of land subdivisions and it's probably up here uh, towards the, 
the top of the street. Okay, so this is Bill as a young schoolboy. Um, last time we talked about how he, um, even though he's an outdoors kid, he loves the outdoors, he always dreamed of it. He, he found the, um, he went to Moss and Prep and then to the um, Skeggs. That's a picture of Moss and Prep at the time and a sort of a Mr. Chips type fellow in this building. Um, but he found the bullying and fagging and that sort of thing in the in the um, in the system a bit. Um, that's the word for you know, like you know. Anyway, but um, for older boys bullying younger boys, um, he did he he really didn't understand it, and he, he kind of was a bit of a loner in a way. Um, the time for war came, so he eventually he kind of got moved away from Skeggs because he he couldn't really you know he just didn't want to be there and then he he went to Armadale school and he didn't he, he I think he you know he just didn't want to be there either but then he, he finally knuckled down and he, he succeeded quite well in his in his sort of last years and then he went off to join up and enlist as from the cadets to to the army so he would have been a um, second lieutenant or something like that um, in in control of a bunch of men at the Liverpool camp. So these were the blokes there that are pretty, um, there's no soft types amongst them. This is what they eventually became as the soldiers at the front. Um, so it's it's interesting, you know, he, he had a sort of a, a humane kind of um, sort of side to him. And, and and he, he got on with with the men and he he described they just sort of described him as a boy mascot company commander. Um, there was one occasion as he does mention where there was um, a huge riot at the camp and there was a massive protest that went into the city. There was um, thousands of men came in and marched through the city and broke up shops and and all the rest of it because they were forced to work more hours or. No, but drill more hours than they thought was um, they could do, and also they weren't allowed to access any grog. That's a couple of them having a studio portrait with a grog. Um, this is a bullet hole at Central Station. There was one one trooper killed um, eventually with by the riot police. So he. He just wants to get out of this camp. Everyone wants to get out of the camp, but he's sort of stuck there because he has to train the men for going overseas. He wants to, he wants something different. And that's when he comes back from us one day and he's, he's in the train, he's reading a magazine and it's got a picture of, and a story about an attack on, on a Zeppelin base in Europe by these machines. And he's just totally, he has a, um, an epiphany and he says, oh, this is what I've got to do. So he's, he's prepared to do anything to, um, to get out. So he does use his dad's connections. He's, he has to convince his father that you know, it's not a complete act of madness getting up in these flying contraptions. Um, but eventually once, once his, his father says yes, then he, he helps pave the way through his connections. And he says he wasn't trying to get out of things. He was, he was just trying to get to where the action was. So just a quick aside, what happened to the camp? After the Liverpool riots, um, it was turned into a what was called the German concentration camp, which is an ironic use of the term. But so basically it was just a prisoner of war camp and for what they called enemy aliens. So that was, um, you know, Germans and Austrian people were unfortunately all thrown in there, um, including survivors of the Emden Sydney battle. And this is them and they've built these little model ships, which it was gave them something to do in the time there. They also like to do a bit of um, pantomime as well, or a few, you know, plays. And um, yeah, so as well as other things, just to keep themselves going, sporting events and, and all the rest of it. So he gets to, to England with his dad's papers and told who to, to see and who to connect with. He gets finally the interview and, um, the interviewing guy, the only thing he's interested in is who his father was, what he does, um, where he went to school, and most importantly, can you ride a horse? 
So basically that's it. If you if you similar to the English upper classes and you ride a horse and go fox hunting, you can you can fly an aeroplane. Um, these are the type of aeroplanes they learn to fly on. It sort of looks like a bathtub with wings. So um, his basic training was um, his instructor said, you Taylor, he said, yes, sir, any instructor any instruction yet? He said, no, sir, I haven't. This is his first time up in the airplane. He said, all right, I'll give you some landings. So they go up in the sky and it's a terrible experience for Taylor because the bloke just sort of gives him control of the plane and doesn't really tell him anything and, 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 and whatever. It turned out the instructor was, a lot of um, pilots were sent back after having uh, nervous breakdowns and he would, was one of those. Taylor didn't know, but still it, was, it wasn't a good, Good thing. So he asked to have another instructor, which happened. Unfortunately, his friend, which is I think the one in the middle, whose name was he was a Rhodes Scholar called um, Whiteman. He a couple of weeks later he found out that he tried to fly the plane himself after one or two lessons and crashed and, and was killed. So a lot of them were killed just in training. Okay. So um, this is a picture from Taylor's book, and it basically shows. Um, his early days in England of flying and a lot of the times they got lost and they just sort of landed in a field somewhere and tried to get directions and then all these people sort of came around and had a look because it was such a, a novel thing. This aeroplane, very strange looking thing, he actually, I think it's the type he's, he flew up to like, you know, tried to push up through the clouds and push the limits of, of his own endurance, you know, that um, and, and actually made it back. It was a near run thing. Um, you lose um, oxygen at certain levels and they, they had no, no sealed um, uh, sort of cockpits or anything, as you can see. So uh, this guy is another fly from Mossman and just quick aside, his name was um, Jack Manning Alport. And when he saw one time Taylor land and he said, um, they are, uh, he was interviewed years later in his older age, he said, well, why is it you, you um, ended up joining the, the flying corps? And he said, well, I really got the idea in Salisbury Plains because an Australian with a BE, that's a type of aeroplane, happened to land near the artillery unit. We were greatly interested in this plane and it turned out to be Bill Taylor. That's a late Sir Gordon Taylor. So these two probably grew up within streets of each other and were over in England. And this bloke was inspired to, to fly aeroplanes because of Taylor. So Taylor finally makes it through training. He picks up his aeroplane and flies to France. Um, he's posted with 66 Squadron and they fly the um, Sopwith Pup. So he gets there. These are the chaps outside their, um, their billet, 66 Squadron. Inside, they um, would decorate them their, um, their, and furnish it as quite well as they could. He describes going to local French town city um, and trying to get something to make it as homely as possible. That include what these Kirshner girls and I looked them up and they were sort of like the um, pin-up girls of the time. So they would have decorated their walls with that. He was led by a fellow called Captain Andrews. That's him there. That's them having a coffee or a, um, a gin or something at the local, at the squadron base. Um, Andrews was a very good Leader, he was. Um, he'd also flown against the 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 Richtofen when he was first starting out and shot down a famous ace called Hawker um, in one of these. Um, I think they're called DH two airplanes. Anyway, this is Taylor at the um, at the base. The pilot is only as good as his mechanic, and um, you know, the guy that looked after the engine and the guy that did all the wiring and all the rest of it. So the planes, of course, were made out of canvas that was doped and um, and these metal wires which kept the whole thing together and the wood. So it was it, it required a lot of craftsmen to put these together. So anyway, there's, there's Taylor and there's his two, two offsiders. You can see this is a uniform from the um, Australian War Memorial. You can see it's pretty much that that uniform, and he's got his DFC, so you can probably place it in time from that. So the Sopwith Pup, this is a someone done done this as a render online. 
Um, this is Taylor's exact plane uh, with the number and his markings. It had one machine gun and it was probably outdated by the time they got it. They, they were waiting for other newer aeroplanes, but he said it was a very nice aeroplane to fly, quite manoeuvrable. This is a bit of a scary picture of Taylor. Um, he mentions that he had to make himself a, a leather mask because of frostbite and also had to make some adjustment, adjustments because of the wind blowing in and, um, and basically blasting your face. They also had to pay for everything. That's why you also had to have a bit of money behind you because you had to pay for your gloves and your and, and all the rest of it. So, okay. All right, so I might have to wind it up soon. This is a picture from Taylor's book. He was originally st um, stationed here at Vert Gallant Farm and then he moved to Estée Blanche. So here is the front line. Um, he had to deal with anti-aircraft fire. It's an interesting picture and there's all different sorts of anti-aircraft guns here. He was able to fly a captured Albatross fighter. He said they were very heavy, but they were sort of like a real, um, really good plane at the, at the early stages of 1917. Um, he fought, he, he first went into the skies during bloody April in 1917 and he had contact with the enemy in the sky then. Um, and so that included different squadrons, um, black planes and colourful planes and, and ones from Rick Doffin's squadrons and a few others. Another pilot, um, Richardson here, on Friday the 13th in bloody April, he was shot down by a fellow named Klein. Um, he was flying one of these B, um, e, uh, FE2D, I think it was. Aeroplanes. As you see, there's two pilots here. He was the gunner at the front, and sorry, there's a gunner and a Zerber and a pilot. Um, unfortunately, he was brought down. He was being awarded um, for his um, for his victory. He, he was an ace, um, and unfortunately, he was shot down on that day. Okay, um, so Bill Taylor had a brother and he joined the artillery. So this is, you might be able to see this picture of him dragging artillery. I think it's from his, his um, 184th Royal Garrison, Garrison Artillery. Um, Ken had heard from a, uh, sorry, Bill had heard from a, another, a, a colleague pilot that he'd run into his brother in a certain sector because he didn't know where he was exactly. And when he found out where he was, he intended, he said, oh, well, I'm going to catch up with him. Um, unfortunately, the next news that Bill got was that um, that Ken had been killed. He was trying to get a message out and they were recording a counterattack. Um, so uh, Bill flew across to his brother's grave, which, um, and it was kind of a sad, lonely experience for him. And, um, and he caught up with his mother in England shortly after, I think, but they were quite sort of reserved about their grief and all the rest of it. So this is Patrick's, um, sorry, Patrick Gordon Taylor, Bill Taylor's um, award. And he got the same one as, as Smithy. Bill Taylor's moment of disillusionment came when he was chasing one of these, um, there was two of them, but the one he was chasing after was what he called a Rumpler, which is a high-flying German reconnaissance plane. Uh, they flew high. He attacked it, and as you see, that it would have been defended by the observer and flown by a pilot in front. Um, he describes he basically came up from underneath it. He could see the the black crosses and and the underneath, and he and he fired and then dropped back down. And then the consequences of that, this was no triumph. The horrible wavy thing in the air had a home, parents. Okay, so we'll go back. He, from my wild triumph at this successful end to a long chase, a dull sense of horror came over me. There was something awful about this doomed aeroplane. So he's hit it, 
and it's streaming black smoke and going down. Then a black object detached itself from the blazing rumpler, a grotesque thing with loose and waving ends. The rear gunner had jumped from death by fire to which my action had condemned him. He appeared to fall quite slowly, passing my machine as though he were almost floating in space. And then he was gone, invisible against the dark earth. The drama above me continued, the rumpler now just a stream of stinking black smoke, slowly put its nose down as pieces came off in flame and smoke. Then the fire seemed to go out, but it burst again, but it burst again in flames and finally hit the ground with a great explosion, leaving a cloud of smoke drifting slowly over the land. This was no triumph. The horrible wavy thing in the air had a home, parents, someone who loved him. Now he was dead, lying crumpled in the earth, killed by me. For the first time, I was horror-stricken by the results of war in the air. Somehow, before it had all remained impersonal, not an aeroplane with a man in it, but a dangerous creature of the air to be destroyed. For some reason, the rumpler was different, or perhaps I had been in France too long. So this next picture is, is what happened to the plane. Everyone was sort of gawking and quite excited about the whole thing, but he just he just went along with it, but he felt quite gutted. And he, he mentions how they say, do you, do you want to look at this thing, the pilot, and he's just like a mangled mess. And so he had no more taste for war. I began to think of my way over the world to my home in Australia, to a line island with my boat moored on the beach, the tent by the banks of trees, the red gum sprawling over the sun beach, sun bleached sandstone rocks, the call of the little penguins coming in from the sea at night. So he just wants to be home. This is his favourite place, um, Lion Island from his childhood. Found his penguins go there, mainly penguins. And, you know, he's out in nature. He just, he just wants to be out of it. So anyway, after this, he goes back to the UK, becomes an instructor. He goes back later on in life um, with his third wife, Joy. They go and visit Ken's grave. And this is sort of like a, you know, um, well, the Americans say a bit of closure. He finds a, the grave of his friend who had been buried by the Germans. He writes his, his pens, his memoirs. In the last years, Bill penned his last memoir with only his logbook. He was surprised to find in the writing they war memories came back to me vividly beyond my highest expectations. To immerse myself completely in distant events and bring them to life again, I wrote in the very early mornings before the life of the present day could impose itself on me. And there in those silent hours, I found myself back at Vertcallen Farm aer Aerodrome with the sound of guns. I saw chaps in the squadron, high air over Carvin and do I, I stalked again the shark like albatross flying my agile little fighter assault with Scout 709. So he's writing um, probably the last few years of his life. He's written a whole lot of books about his flying. So he's, he's having memories, but luckily he's um, triggered by his, um, his log books at the time, otherwise trying to remember back that far as, you know, going to be a bit hazy. Okay, so at the um, art gallery, some of the, um, the mementos that were donated from him, this is the black cat, which he kept in his plane as a, as a lucky charm. They all had lucky charms, or well, not all of them, but they were, they were superstitious and had, this was um, Bill Taylor's, he stuck on his, um, near his windscreen. Um, also a scarf and what they called a maternity jacket because it because it was sort of billowing billowed out. Um, that's part of his uniform. When I was in France, I did a tour of the battlefields. Unfortunately, um, it didn't go past this area, but I did find it on Google Maps. So his first aerodrome, I was able to locate near this farmstead. And then in Google Maps, you can see, and if you read his writings, he mentions you know farmhouses and all the rest of it. Um, so when he went back, he started having all these memories and imagining planes flying off and all the rest of it. So basically it would have been in one of these two fields that his squadron 19 SPADs and SE Pfizer 56 were located. Okay, so into the future, this will be the next talk, the golden age of aviation. I was also preparing some, um, an exhibition which includes some, some scale models and various videos and all the rest of it. So that kept me, um, whoops, kept me busy in, in uh, lockdown. Um, and the first one was a new challenge um, and a learning curve with that sort of thing. But anyway, um, if you're interested in um, the stories I've done, this is the um, website link here. 
there's a Facebook site as well, or you can contact me on these emails. So I think we're, we're pretty close to time. In fact, just, just over. So we can open up to any questions if, if you're interested. Um, hopefully still awake. Uh, I can't hear you, James. I think you're muted. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, we're, we're unmuted now. Yeah. Oh, uh, look, a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Uh, you got enough material for about 10 talks there. Yeah, yeah. Um, can I mention a couple of things? I saw on your Ulm record. Yeah. Um, the abbreviation SW means shrapnel wound. Shrapnel wound, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So gunshot wound is abbreviated GSW. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So he probably got shrapnel in the knee, but I mean, still obviously very bad. Yes. But possibly not as bad as being hit by a bullet in the knee, which would be very bad news indeed, I'd say. Yes, definitely. Yes. I th um, I another thing was that, you know, you mentioned the man, uh, Seven Mile Beach, uh, south of Jeringong. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I heard a radio interview with the guys in Albion Park who are rebuilding the replica Southern Cross. Right. They said that they're definitely not going to land on Seven Mile Beach. <laughs> too dangerous. Yeah, yeah no. Um... Yes, I I, th I don't think they'd want to go to that um, extreme <laughs> length of um, representation. Well, I, th I think your picture of the flooded uh, uh, beach it was in New Zealand, wasn't it? But that that uh, that shows you the problem, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, it, there could have been one in New Zealand. I've still got to look into it. I think that one was in um, in Ireland actually, when they yeah. were flying um, from there. To, they were intended to fly from there to America. Oh, oh cool. Okay. Yeah. Now, you got to tell us why it was called Chiller. Why, why was Kingsford Smith called Chiller? I've, I've got the book here. I'll, give me a minute and I'll look it up. Oh, oh, oh okay. All right. <laughs> There's so much stuff in there. That I, there was, I remember thinking about that and then I, I didn't. So, but I'll, I'll find out for you, James. No, no, no that's, that's, that's no problem. But um, it was a family nickname. I think it had something to do with school days and, um, or I could be confusing or something else. But he, because they came originally from America, um, he, and he had a bit of a mohawk. They sort of called him after an Indian name or something, and that morphed into his family name or something like that. I oh, cool. But okay. I'll find out. I'll find out. Yeah. But they, the family actually called him Chilla. They didn't call him um, Charles. Yeah. Well, well, uh, that's what people call Prince Charles, don't they? Is it? Chilla. Yeah. Oh well, there you, it's a bit of new knowledge for you there. Oh, yeah. No. Now, um, on your slide that was scraps with the Hun. Uh, you know about the Coburn Lang photographs, don't you? No. No, okay. There was a, a, a famous collection of, of World War I photographs, which are like, uh, you know, you've got many planes all in close proximity to each other, and there's one of a man falling out of a burning albatross. And that's oh, yeah, 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 right, yeah, right. yeah. Now, yeah. now those, those photographs um, uh, were, have been reproduced many, many times, and they're often yeah. treated as history, but they're actually a collection of fakes. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And yeah, yeah. They, uh, but they were made by an RFC chap who worked in Hollywood. So he had all the skills to make a realistic uh, depiction. Yeah. And they're much better than the official photographs of the time. Yeah. Um, I, I think also your pictures of the, the balloon, the Zeppelin being shot and the strafing, they were also um, out of movies, weren't they? Yes, they were, yeah. Well spotted. Um, yeah. So I'll just, I'll try and find those so people know. But um, yeah, no, that, I, that was to create atmosphere. That's probably what, the original fakes were, were doing so um, oh well i, I think yeah. that they probably captured the atmosphere much better than any realistic photograph could have done at the time yeah well i don't think there's any there's any and it would have been in fact impossible to try and take a photograph like that yeah yeah almost um, one other very short thing about the fe2 you know the two-seater pusher plane yeah uh, where you were mentioning the chap who got shot down yes but an fe2 actually shot von richthofen the red baron down yeah, that's true. And he was hit in the back of a head with a machine gun bullet. Yeah. And um, it, it produced a head wound, which you can see in photographs that, you know, he had his head wrapped up um, uh, not too long before he was shot down in the end. Yeah. Um, but the funny thing was, how do, you, how do you shoot somebody in the head with a machine gun bullet and not kill them? And apparently the FE2 was going, if you like, to the left, and von Richthofen was going to the right, and, and the FE2 gunner was pointing backwards, right? So he shot, he shot von Richthofen as they passed each other. 
Right. So he shot von Richthofen from behind, but the relative velocity to the two aeroplanes would have greatly reduced the velocity of the machine gun bullet. Right. So when it hit von Richthofen's uh, leather helmet, it, it didn't penetrate enough to kill him. Right. Yeah. So it was quite, he was but, shooting, uh, shooting from, Richthofen was coming from behind, he was shooting from behind. Uh, no, no. So the the FE2 had a gunner in the front cockpit out in the nose of the aircraft. Right. And he could shoot in all directions, including over the top of the wing behind. Yeah. So if I'm ricked off and going this way, yeah. and the FE2 is going that way, and right. the gunner shot back into the back of Richthofen's head. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was a, that was a very close call for Richthofen. Well, yeah, but the, the, two, the two aeroplanes' velocities would have subtracted from the bullet velocity. Mm, right, right. So yeah. say the bullet was doing, say, 400 miles an hour, right? And the two planes are doing, say, 300 miles an hour in combination. Yeah, yeah. So the bullet's doing 100 miles an hour, therefore not, not enough velocity to actually... The physics of it. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, the randomness of it all as well. So. Oh, yeah, well, uh, yes, von Richthofen was very lucky because after he was hit, um, he also passed out, like, like um, you mentioned in your story as well. Mm. Um, that was Smithy, wasn't it, who passed out for 30 seconds? Yeah, yeah, yes. So, yeah. yeah, von Richthofen passed out and again only recovered, you know, crash landed um, with great difficulty. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I've read accounts where that's quite, that, that happened. I guess that you, you might black out when you're doing a dive anyway, but there's accounts of people blacking out and then recovering just before they hit the ground and that sort of thing. So, yeah, well, if Smithy had a boot full of blood, then he's lost enough blood to basically pass out anyway. Yeah, so, yeah. exactly. So, and he sounds like he tended to exaggerate things, but it, it sounds <laughs> I, I couldn't I couldn't verify because but you sound like the the you know the armor or whatever counted 180 bullet holes and it sounds about right, you know. Yeah. So um yeah, so now also some, the uh, mystery lady in your uh, photograph with Smithy in 1933 at yes. Mascot, yeah, I think is his second wife, Lady Mary. Oh, okay, yeah. right, okay, yeah. She she looks like a nice lady. Uh, apparently, yeah, he was uh, uh, a bit of a ladies' man, you know. Oh, yeah. As yeah. I say, one bit in particular. <laughs> well, he got into trouble, like in England, because he was doing joy flights and he was basically taking ladies off into secluded areas and, um, you know, into love trysts and all the rest of it. Or, you know, you have to, you know, some of it's bravado and rumour, but it sounds like there was enough floated through in these insurance scams to, to get him some reputation damage enough that, you know, Oh, they, they were dramatic days. So, yeah. yeah, they were. They were living life on the edge. So, yeah. yeah, and that's how he was. He, he just he lived his life on the edge. Um, so, I mean, he wasn't without. I, I remember reading somewhere that he had a fear of water. And he he was known to have a like when he's flying over of water to have panic attacks and that sort of thing. So he wasn't <laughs> like total. You know, um, the the image is you know the image we have of him is always it's always different from. I guess. Yeah. The real person, so. yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I had to. Sorry, there's a lot of material to cover there, so hopefully, I didn't, um, yeah. Well, I, I think it's great, I really enjoyed it. Thank you very oh, much. Great. Yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, Dara, it's Des Sheehan here. Um, okay, hello, you. hello. Um, I, I found your extracts from uh, um, Taylor's uh, book, and uh, his recollections were fascinating. and. Mm. Very much in context, uh, and uh, the um, uh, yes, I, I, I just wanted to congratulate you on on a on a great talk. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Chris. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's a it's a whole new format, and um, it wasn't that rehearsed. So <laughs> we, we got through it. I surprised. It was. I thought, oh, am I going on too much? And then we we're. Um, it was only um, four minutes past the hour, so there's probably enough to take in anyway. So, yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. So, no, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dara, are you are you in the library at the moment? Uh, we're in this what's called the creation space, so it's sort of, sort of like the library. Yeah. Right. Look, the um, with the audio, there were some dropouts due to the the microphone is going. You know how it has a threshold level. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, not serious, but just occasionally. Mm. And uh, so. Uh, you might want to get them to look at a, a, a better microphone for doing these sort of talks on the... Sure, sure. The yeah, thanks. That's good feedback. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. Oh, not a big deal, but just, uh, you, you know, yeah. so a few percent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, it could be the interference of the walls or something like that. Oh, it is rather echoey where you are, so that's another issue. Oh, okay, right. Because yeah. echoes can interfere with the, you know, the, uh, the computer's trying to say, oh, cut out the background noise, and it actually cuts out your, your speech a little bit. All right. Okay. All right. Can, can I just ask quickly, um, uh, was there an earlier talk that you gave um, uh, on, on this subject, and how can we access that? Yeah, okay. So the early talk was, um, it was on Facebook Live, and that's on the um, on the Facebook part of the site, which I can I'll consider you the details for that. Um, it's basically those first slides I showed you, but in more detail. So it's probably nothing new. But um, I, I was um, we just had a, a few technical difficulties at the time, and you couldn't really see the slide properly. That's why I was I was going to cut all that out. Um, and, and that would have given more time for other things. But I thought I'd just go through it quickly because okay. the slides sort of were more impressive like that. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, I hope, um, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And um, yeah, hopefully you'll catch up and I'll be able to add a bit more information. With Taylor, that he, they claim that he had he shot down five, but I've been looking into he only claims um, one or maybe two. So it'd be interesting to cross records. Um, there are claims for the squadron, but it's um, claims and actual work are two different things. So. Uh, Darren, can I just ask? Yeah. With PG Taylor. Yeah. Um, Look, I might have missed it. I, I actually, uh, my wife came in with buttered toast. So that was a. <laughs> but did you mention his plane down in Canberra? He's got a plane in Canberra. Oh, the um, which yeah, one? The DH9. Oh, okay. Um, uh, sorry, actually, is it the same PG Taylor who was in the um, England to Australia air race? No, he. I don't think he was. There was another Taylor. There was probably another Taylor. Oh, good. Okay, I got the wrong yeah. guy. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, this one. Um, yeah, no, I don't think he. I don't think he did much flying straight after the war, but you know he picked up after that. He was sort of up at pit water and they got a gypsy moth and put floats on it. And I think he was doing that, you know, just that sort of thing. And then eventually he was flying Catalinas and, you know. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, I imagine your next talk is on a lot of PG Taylor's uh, cross Pacific flights and things like that. I've got a few of his books that um, uh, oh, yeah. talk, talk about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, that, is that what your next talk is going to be yeah, about? That's what it's leading to. So this yeah. was about their war service, um, yeah. how that leads into into all the um, the specific flights, or whatever. So, but you might have to wait off that one. So yeah. But I, I can see a future talk on expanding on Taylor, for instance, uh, oh, as yeah. well. It, it would be yeah. quite interesting. Yeah, you know, he sounds like an interesting character. That's um, not not all that well known. Yeah, uh, well, that's right. And, and reading his writing. It's, it's really good because you get the human being behind it and um, see there's not much on OM. Apparently it was a manuscript on OM, but never got, it never something, I don't know, something happened to that. There's a bit on Smithy, but it's a little bit sort of, bit, you know, um, yeah, it's not not quite as good as the Taylor stuff. So. No, I was going to say there's a, there's a whole talk on Taylor just on his oh, own, really. Yeah, I could just do it on him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. just in the war. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'd like to do that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Right, well, thank you, Dara. That was a fabulous presentation. Thank you for putting in all of the obviously hours and hours of work that you did on that. It was so well researched and so interesting. So thank you very much, and we look forward to having you back for next instalment. Thank you, and I believe this talk will be uploaded to the library's YouTube channel, so you can watch it again and tell all your friends about it. And thanks, Dara. Okay. Thank all right. Thanks for coming, everyone. Okay. Bye for now. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. See you, Des. See you, James.